Welcome back. My name is Matthew Leffler, and you're joining the Fleeting Conversations podcast. You might know me as Matt, the armchair attorney, Matt, the trailer enthusiast, but really, I'm a guy who wants to think about innovation. What is the landscape that we're playing in? What does the future look like? This is what we're going to talk about. And I'm so excited to have the guests join us today. We'll get to them in just a minute. Uh, obviously, Jason Miller, Britton Ladd, two of the very biggest leading voices in logistics and innovation and what we see in the industry. Now, I'm coming fresh off, fresh off of Manifest 2024. And when I was at Manifest for my very first time, there was a, a keynote speaker that really, really stood out for me. And that was the CIO for DHL. And she told the story of labor in the workforce. Globally, DHL has over 180,000 employees. 90% of those employees are actually, you know, hourly. And every year they lose between 40 and 70% of all of those workers. The dependency on labor is not a new problem. No. It is not. When I think back to the greatest innovations of supply chain, I think of things like containerization. I think of things like the Motor Care Act of 1980, things that could pull cost away from operating a truck. It is very dangerous work being a truck driver. One of the seven or so most dangerous jobs in the United States. And for high school educated men, it is the most common profession in every single state. But 2023 saw some very interesting movement. And I'm going to talk about those two really important things as we frame our conversation today with Britton and with Jason. The first thing was a very cool thing called a Supplemental Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking by the FMCSA, the regulatory body that governs the safety uh, and compliance of over-the-road interstate motor carriers. And what this advanced notice of supplemental rulemaking was all about was level four and level five automation. Let me slow down. Level four automation is about a remote operator, somebody who is operating the machine, but not in the cab. Level five automation, even further to achieve, is the remote assistant. The idea that there would be somebody who can help the robot, whether it's talking to law enforcement or producing records to a shipper, but there is no human controlling that machine. That's level five automation. Now, it still seems like those things are far, far away. Almost we can touch, but not quite. The other very interesting legal development was around a bill in the state of California. The bill was going to require a human being inside every single autonomous truck on the California streets. Many people thought that Governor Newsom was going to sign that bill and essentially force any autonomous vehicle manufacturer in the heavy duty space to completely destroy the business model they were thinking they wanted to do. Governor Newsom vetoed that bill. That sets the stage for what we see in the industry. We are at an inflection point, an inflection point that we may not necessarily fully understand yet, but I hope by the end of this conversation, you'll have a chance to really get a grip on what is at stake, what will change, and how our industry, the movement of all of the things, will look, not in five years, not in 10 years, but 15 or 20. I fundamentally believe that what we are going to see unfold over the next few years, we'll look back on decades from now and realize we are experiencing a fundamental change, a robotics revolution. And at the end of the day, it's adapt or die. That's the nature of this industry. The nature of this industry has always been. It's not an easy business. If everyone could do it, they probably would. But because they know it's how hard it is, they certainly can't do that. Now, I will say one last thing, and I am so excited to say this on our very first Lunch and Learn. I hope you have a great snack with you. We have a sponsor. We have a partner. And it is one of the most interesting companies that I've ever learned about. And I've known about them in a bunch of different names. I used to call them Dial-A-Truck. 
They go by DAT, Freight and Analytics, or DAT, for decades. DAT has been the way that truckers find their way home. This is a leading product that has been in the industry since the days of putting a board at a travel center, telling drivers what they can do, where they can go, and how much they're going to get for it. DAT is a friend of truckers, and that's so am I. I want every trucker to get home in the same condition that they left. And finding profitable work is important. And this is one of the things that DAT has strove to do over its time in the business. A lot more to come from this. Again, I am so excited that we have this incredible sponsor to help us create this uh, conversation for all of you. But enough of that. Enough of the pleasantries. We have to get into the guests, the people that are making this thing all possible. As I always say, I am overjoyed when I get to talk to these two leaders. I, I People throw on the, the phrase thought leader a little bit too easily, but these two, they are thought revolutionaries. These are people who, when you hear them speak, you listen. And I am so jazzed to welcome back friends of the show, Jason Miller and Britton Ladd. Gentlemen, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm living La Vida Loca, Britain. This is so exciting. I, 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 you put up a post a couple weeks ago, and it was about UPS potentially divesting Coyote. And in that, the, the exchange on that uh, conversation, Jason jumped in there, and I had to say to everybody, "Hey, uh, can I get you two to come on a podcast?" And lo and behold, look where we are. We did it. They said it couldn't be done. Uh, Jason, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. How you doing, Matt? I'm so excited that I'm not traveling right now. I, I've traveled so much in the past few weeks. And one of the things we wanted to kind of really jump into, and we talked about before we went live, was um, the data around robotics uh, being imported into the country. Could you share a little bit of that information uh, for the folks that are watching at home? Yeah, no, it, it's been fascinating the U.S. over the last couple of decades. We used to actually be a laggard for importing robots. If you look back 2007, even 2010, 2012, we were behind Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Japan. Right now, we brought in last year 120,000 industrial robots, or actually closer to 130,000. And that's specific you know, number of units. If you go back just 15 years ago, we're bringing in five or 6,000 a year, which just shows the changing nature of that sector and how we've went from a laggard to a world leader in that space. And these robots are being used in manufacturing and warehousing, et cetera. So they're multi-purpose. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about those robots and how they get used. Britain, you have been a prolific writer on the various technologies employed by warehousing and distribution and fulfillment. Can you speak a little bit about like what kind of technology are we seeing in, in the space right now? So it's really quite interesting. You primarily have AMRs, you have AGVs, and they're literally just small platform robots. Uh, the AMRs, they can pick up things, they can move it. It's really the movement of materials is primarily what these robots are doing. But then you have some really cool robots out there, the bipedal robots, like from the company Agility Logistics. And what Agility, Agility Logistics is doing is they're saying, well, look, we can create these robots that look like have a human form and they can you know, walk and they can pick up things and so on and so forth. And I expect we're going to see more types of robots like that, but there's also robotics that you can slide in a trailer and unload the trailer. Uh, there's, there's new types of forklifts. The, the number and the different styles of robots that are coming out are, are almost unlimited. And I have all these startups that reach out to me and they show me what they're making and everything. And I'm like, wow, this is really getting interesting because people aren't afraid to put something out there. Robots that you look at and say, well, what is that? And then it unfolds almost like a transformer and it can really do these interesting things. And so I really say to people, there's no more science fiction and there's no more future. It's here. It's now. And the robots are they've already arrived and they're just going to grow. They're going to become even more common. And it's one of the things where when I write, I say to companies, robots are not a luxury. They're a must have. And especially when you look at warehousing, where there are nearly 650,000 warehouse jobs that are still unfilled, uh, those really are demanding the use of robotics. And these warehouse companies, companies like Amazon, DHL, and so forth, 
they all look out there and say, we really have no choice. We can't find enough people. Our labor costs are through the roof and we have to have these robots. That's a great point you bring up. So when we talk about like trucking generally, besides fuel, which is usually the biggest cost for a motor carrier, labor is the close number two, sometimes even higher. And then you have the asset, you have the maintenance and the insurance and all the other things. But when it talks about cost, like this is what is so striking to me because not just with warehouse, but like the turn rate of like how long a warehouse worker stays on average in the U S is about 43 to 45% leave every single year. So if you're trying to control cost, like this is a, a, an in interesting way to start with that. Jason, what do you feel we're we're watching in the warehousing automation space? Do you see this becoming ubiquitous for everybody? Are there really just a couple of players that are doing it? How do you view this in the overall scheme of American employment? Yeah, so I think a couple pieces of that is first on the labor, you know, labor recruitment side. One of the big challenges we've had is over the last 10 years or so, we've tre tremendously increased the warehousing footprint, but we haven't done that uniformly across the U.S. It's been very concentrated in certain markets. So the Inland Empire in, you know, east of Los Angeles, outside New York City, outside Atlanta, et cetera. What that does is that really places a lot of strain on local labor capacity. People don't want to drive th more than 30, 45 minutes for a job. And then you're having very taxing physical jobs. You're walking, you know, 10, 15, 20 miles in a day. And so I think part of the labor challenge there has been how this e-commerce emphasis for the warehousing footprint over the last decade or so has really taxed local labor markets, um, which then therefore you need more robots uh, to try to at least pick up some of the slack. I think moving forward, it always depends on the type of warehouse you're looking at. I mean, you know, take Amazon. Everybody thinks of super highly automated facilities, but when you look, a key type of warehouse Amazon has is what they call large non large non sortable, meaning you cannot move this thing on a conveyor belt. You're having to go literally physically pick the product. And when you look at transportation economics, you're going to have a lot of those facilities because large non-sortable items, you want to get close to end consumers to keep transportation costs low. So you may have a whole bunch of these in a metropolitan statistical area. So I think it will really just depends on the type of facility. A warehouse to support manufacturing activity where you're moving pallets around has a very different demand than a warehouse for a industrial supply wholesaler where it's you know, picking and packing nuts and bolts. So I think it's always going to be application specific. Well, to build off that, uh, Britton, you're very familiar with the, the the style of Amazon and how the robots that they use, how they deploy those. Can you speak a little bit about that? Like, how does Amazon view the robotics push? Well, it's really interesting. Amazon's philosophy about robotics is automate where possible. And so in the facilities, the fulfillment centers where they can easily sort product, they have robots everywhere and they leverage the robots as much as possible. The trick is Amazon's pretty much reached the point where they can automate the facilities that they have. They're looking at building much larger facilities, the motherships, for example, um, which can be as much as 4 million square feet. They'll be the wow. largest facilities on earth. They've already built a couple of them. The goal is to have anywhere from eight to 16. I actually think they're going to have more. But these are multi-story facilities. And so now it becomes, as Dr. Miller said, application specific. And so when you have a facility as large as 4 million square feet and multiple stories, it's not that you can just take the same robotics that exist and put in there. You literally have to engineer an entire new way to leverage the robotics. But more importantly, you have to create new robotics that don't exist. And that's why Amazon has ro Amazon Robotics. They have their own team that does this. They, I'm in constant discussion with them. They're always reaching out to me, asking my opinion. And the thing that I really stress to Amazon and Walmart and other companies is that I think you need to step back for a moment. <clears throat> and I think what you have to stop doing is saying, well, we'll just add more robots. We'll just add more robots. And I really think what they need to do is say, wait a minute, how do we just engineer something so different? We not only need, we, we not only don't need humans, but we actually can reduce the total number of robots that we need because we've totally changed the process. And we're basically changing the process to where maybe we create a new type of robot. It doesn't exist, but we know we can build it. And we're able to move some of the large non-sortable 
products. We're able to move multiple products at the same time. And that's the thing that I really keep saying to these companies is, is you're just throwing more robots at the problem, just like you used to throw more people at the problem. That's right. That's and right. I don't really see how that in the long run helps. And what I say to them is rethink this entire thing. You're going and picking one or two or three items in a control station. Is it possible that you actually can just simply change the entire process and you're not picking anything? You're almost just simply automatically sending it to a, you know, a boxing line, a pick, and, a pick and pack line, something completely different to where you're avoiding the need of a human or a robot at all. What would it take to do that? And there are actually some really cool designs out there uh, that companies are coming up with the saying, well, what if robot? So here's how I say to them. Imagine people don't exist and robots don't exist. So how would you move the product? And when you look at it from that point of view, it really opens the door to some really interesting possibilities. And I really believe that we're going to run into a problem that, wow, you know what? We have all these robots, but we're now no longer, we're not faster. We're not cheaper. We actually have so much complexity um, that it's not really working as we had hoped, as we had, had designed. And I think we just need to step back a second and say, let's not think that robots are really the only answer. Maybe we need a completely different way of looking at everything that we're doing. And that, to me, is what I think is really exciting. I, I'm with you. I think that the jobs of the future will be robotic repair technician. Like they can outsource or you can make robots do a lot of things, but the, the humans that are going to service those things are going to be critical. There's a comment I'm going to bring up here because I think this is interesting. Uh, it says, why the cry about talent shortage in the supply chain? And I'm going to start off by kind of giving a little bit of my my understanding. And Jason, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you after I get through this. But Back in the old days, before deregulation in 1980, uh, the average truck driver was bringing home, let's say, $38,000 a year, somewhere in that range. You adjust that for inflation, that's like $110,000, $120,000. Like those jobs are manifestly different than they are today. So the, the challenge of like the, the cry of driver shortage, technician shortage, uh, warehouse worker shortage, it's really, in my opinion, uh, a function of People don't want to do it as cheap as we're willing to pay. Like if we're going to pay them more, maybe you'd have less attrition. But this is kind of the nature, I think, of these jobs. They're highly, highly physical. The high churn rate and compensation, just not the same as we people kind of expected. Do you have any thoughts on that, Jason? Yeah, so I think we have to, you know, the, to me, there's a couple of distinctions here. The, you can you almost always find somebody to do the job. Now, is that the person you want to do the job? That's a completely separate question, right? And so to me, the phrase a talent shortage just has to do with, are we keeping, you know, and this is where universities play a key role, especially for those white collar jobs, you know, are we keeping curriculums up to date for what industry needs, um, while at the same time also not becoming trade schools. This is where there's always a give and take of, do you teach this specific software application? I'll give an example. Uh, years ago, the Brogue College was all in on learning Tableau, because if you go back about a decade, Tableau was where it was at. Now it's all Microsoft Power BI. And no offense to Tableau, it hardly ever gets mentioned anymore. If you have folks investing in learning one software and then they, you know, things switch, it always becomes challenging. So I think part of it could be um, universities needing to, you know, keep a tight grip on what the skill sets industries need. Um, but I think, too, to be honest, Matt, you called it right, is a lot of managers want to just, you know, they want an external excuse to say, well, there's a talent shortage. That's why I can't recruit anybody. Whereas it's like maybe you aren't paying enough money at the end of the day or maybe you're, you know, you're offering a job that is not doesn't have the parameters that folks are looking for. I couldn't agree more. Now, I'm wondering, Britton, like how should workers be thinking about how they coexist with a robot? So someone jumps into the industry, they become, they work at a warehouse, work at a distribution center. What is that like relationship between the human and the robot? Is the robot taking more and more of the opportunity or is there still a, a really heavy presence of, you know, human beings hand packing things, getting ready to ship out? Well, currently there is a lot there are a lot of humans that are part of the process. They are working with the robots. What I always say to people and the things that I write about, I always say this, become an expert in all things robotics, no matter what job you do. If you're in a warehouse or you're 
working um, in any type of facility that's leveraging AMRs and AGVs or any other type of robots. Become an expert in those robots. Understand really what is the goal of the company so that number one, you can interact with them and work with them correctly. But more importantly, you become more of a knowledge worker who can be working with management and saying, you know what, it's interesting. We have seven robots and I came up with this great idea that, you know what, we can actually add four more robots. And then now we only need one human there. And I'd like to actually run that project. And so I always go back to this point. I think workers still do a terrible job, many of them, of not managing their careers. They simply just react to what's available. They react to what happens to them. And I think that's very dangerous. And especially with the technology we have today, especially when we talk about AI, and far too many people just go with the flow and they get fired in this job and they're like okay i'll find another one they go to that job you know they they have to work with robots they really don't know anything about them they try and and do the job but maybe they're not doing it correctly or maybe they do a great job but because of progress they can get rid of more humans and so i always believe and i'm sure dr miller says this much better than me i think people have to plan their future and not just let the future happen to them and so when you know there's new technology and everything like that, you better step back and say, so how does this impact me? And whether it's Matt or Dr. Miller or me or anybody else, these technologies can absolutely disrupt our lives. So it behooves us to be smart enough to say, not only am I going to embrace this technology, I'm going to see how do I start to use it? You know, how do I embrace it so that I become someone who can leverage this technology? And now I'm looked at as someone who's an expert in the technology versus someone they can replace with the technology. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I, one of the things that I think of is like the best way to predict the future is to just invent it yourself. Sure. And like that is, that's the, 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 you know, best, if you have the opportunity. Now there's a question here, I'm going to show this briefly. And it says, how does one assess the right automation for you? Obviously the investment can be significant, but in the name of capability building and future proofing, one can become blind towards the return on investment. And if the automation truly enhanced your productivity. So it's this idea of like, you know, what do you make the right choices? Um, I, my recommendation for everybody who's watching us or listening to us, uh, you should call Britton Ladd. Uh, that's what he does. Uh, that's probably the best way to go. But, but, asking you, Jason, like, how does someone justify the capital expenditure for a, a warehouse of saying, well, the real estate's going to cost us X, but the real issue is going to be all of the automation is going to have to go into this thing. How does someone plan for something that massive? Yeah, I mean, it, again, it just comes to, it comes down to strategic planning. I mean, most companies have essentially investment templates if they've been doing this quite frequently. I mean, it's taking a look and saying, okay, well, you know, we're putting this facility in. How is this expected? You know, if we're talking additional warehouse, are we looking at thinking there's additional sales to be gained versus how is this going to cut transportation costs? I mean, that's the usually the key thing with a warehousing question is you're adding another facility and in doing so, you're incurring a fixed cost for the facility, higher total network wide inventory. But in return, you're getting your transportation footprint down because, hey, on average, these parcel shipments are now a hundred miles rather than previously there were 400 miles type of thing. So it's just being able to work with the data that your company has um, and or being able to go procure that data um, from somewhere else. Well, what do you think about that, Britton? Like, how do you go to a, a, a a client and say, listen, uh, you're, you're behind the times, which is, uh, you're very good at when you, when you have your articles about calling out people who are making mistakes in real time. How do you, how do you approach someone as they try to understand how best to leverage the technologies? Well, I mean, again, I'm grateful. I, I got to work for Deloitte. I got to work for Cap Gemini. I provided consulting to McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Bain and Company. So I've learned some, from some really talented individuals. So I understand the process that when I go do a current state assessment of a company, what I'm really looking for are opportunities for automation. I'm looking for, so how is their network aligned, you know, outlined? Uh, where are the facilities located? Do they have too many warehouses? Do they have, do they not have enough warehouses? So I'm basically doing, you know, network optimization analysis. I'm doing transportation optimization analysis. You know, how do I put facilities uh, in locations? I minimize the total amount of miles traveled to deliver products. I look at the automation, say you have no automation or you only have conveyors or whatever. And then it's a matter of saying, so what type of operation do they have today? What could we change the operation to 
where do robotics fit in uh, and other automation? And then it's a matter of simply writing um, the proposal and saying, this is what it will cost. And I always give three options. A, a fully automated, B, you know, you know semi-automated, C, primarily manual, but with a better network and things like that. And there are really great people out there who can do this. Like I said, the consulting firms can do this. Um, there's some boutique consulting firms that can do this. The thing that I really stress to people is don't guess at this. Um, really put the time, money, and effort into this because there are too many companies that are like, hey, I tell you what, let's get Bob. Bob can do this because every day he runs to the mail room and that mail always makes it to my desk. So he's got to be an expert in logistics. Um, and so they put Bob in charge. And I think that's a terrible idea, just as I think it's a terrible idea that I see a lot of companies promoting people into the position of chief supply chain officer who have no supply chain experience. They don't have a degree in supply chain and they simply are promoting these individuals as a way to promote them within the company. And that's going to end up hurting these companies because these individuals have no skills in robotics. And the other thing that I stress is, where do you fit in your industry? And very few people talk about this. So if I'm Starbucks or I'm Foot Locker or whatever, where do I fit in my industry? Who are my competitors? And five years from now, where do I want to be? Do I only want to be selling tennis shoes? Do I want to be in another category? And I think the thing that Amazon proved is that you can start out selling books, but Amazon kept asking, so what else can we do? Where do we fit? And what Amazon realized is they're a virtual company, which means they can virtually do anything they set their mind to. And that's really what I think is missing from a lot of these discussions and discussions in the boardroom. People are latching on to robotics. People are latching on to like supply chain optimization and stuff. But what they're not really asking is, so what are we going to be, you know, what are we going to be when we grow up? You know, what are we going to be five years from now? And I think you really need to have the right thought leaders in these roles who can say, why do we think we only can do X? Why can't we do these other things as well? Why can't we create another company? Why can't we enter another industry, another category? And that, I think, is what's going to have to happen. Because the thing that I say to companies more than anything is increased velocity. And it's so, it's so misunderstood at the executive level. So what does that mean? That means you improve the ability to go fast everywhere across your company. The decision making, the buying, the manufacturing, the supply chain, everything. But what that also does is give you the ability to say, we now have a supply chain that enables our growth. And I've always said, supply chain is designed to do one thing, enable growth. And if you can put a supply chain like that in place that enables your growth, and you have an executive team that has the confidence to say, we now understand we can enter other categories and other industries. That's how these companies are gonna stay one step ahead of everybody. And the other thing we have to remember is the China model is now on our shores. China has stopped saying, we're going to be the manufacturer to the world. And what China is saying is, we're going to be the retailer to the world. Their own retail-backed companies, Xi'an, Timu, and TikTok. And I'm telling you, I'm amazed at how many executives spend no time on this at all. But these three companies are going to revolutionize much of what takes place in business, not just retail. That alone could be another topic for, for oh. you, Matthew. That, that's a fascinating segue. I'm going to bring this to Jason because now I'm kind of curious. So the idea of how we reduce the cost of anything is to make it somewhere else, make it where the labor is more affordable. But if we see this idea of you know, China plus one or near showing whatever, is there a point where robotics can make things more, uh, let's say, uh, just cheaper in general in the U.S.? Or is it still this idea that the labor is so cheap, so affordable, there's really not a, a major need to move a lot of stuff domestically? The, the latter. Um, the U.S. labor costs are just way too high in comparison. And there is a brutal reality that stuff that got offshore 20 some years ago, it ain't coming back. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and specifically, too, when we talk about what it means to reshore, people abuse that term. Reshoring is a very specific meaning. Activity used to be performed in the United States either by a company or by a supplier to that company. That activity, so let's say by you know produce producing some input, we no longer either produce domestically or buy domestically. We now either produce 
overseas in a plant that we own or we buy from an overseas supplier. We stop buying from that supplier or, or no longer supply the U.S. from that plant. And then we actually open either our, another facility in the U.S. to reserve the U.S. or we start buying domestically. Most of the discussion of reshoring is simply organic expansion. TSMC building those fabs in Arizona, that's not a reshoring thing. That's TSMC expanding their footprint so they've got world-class facilities not in Taiwan. Intel building that complex outside of Columbus, Ohio, that's not a reshoring thing. That's an organic expansion where they're making a long-term bet on semiconductor demand combined with uh, U.S. government largesse. Um, when you when you look, we're not seeing any type of you know substantial rebound from reshoring. And you look at these sectors that got just absolutely devastated when we offshored apparel manufacturing. Yeah. We used to make seven to eight times as much apparel in the United States just back in the 1990s as we do today. Do you see anybody clamoring to open apparel factories, you know, in large margin in the U.S.? So there's no amount of robotics that's going to make cut and sew apparel profitable in the U.S. for everyday items. Yes, you're going to have your boutique designers that are going to produce things, but that doesn't count. Oh, that, that's fascinating. This is the thing is like when you go to these conferences, you feel like there is this momentum and it might just be, you know, kind of the sales and marketing aspect of it. Like this is the future. Uh, Britain, how are you seeing this in, in your practice? Are you seeing most people gravitating towards some form of automation or are we still for the most part just not worrying about it and letting that be a, a future problem to deal with well i wouldn't say we're they're not thinking about it or not worrying about it the problem is there's so much talk about robotics out there um but there's really still not a lot of evidence that automation really is worth the investment now maybe if you're a warehouse and you can replace people with robotics there's an investment, but what if you're an insurance company? You know, what if you're a car dealership? What if you're a restaurant? So there's, there are many, many industries where they look at it and say, well, I get that there's an importance of robotics, but what robotics are really available for our industry? So robotics are really right now directed towards a few specific industries, but many industries just don't have the robots that they feel comfortable investing in. And here's the brutal truth. And I love writing about this. Um, there is so much flat out lying from <laughs> companies. When it comes to robots, it's absolutely hilarious. There have been multiple conferences that have been held last year and some have been held this year where the robots they put on the floor were actually made by people from movie studios. Um, and this is in China from Latin America and they're just props. They don't work. Or if they move, it's because they simply have a small motor with some wheels on it, and there's someone with a remote control yeah, the remote making, operator. making it move. The robots don't work. And so right now, a lot of robotics are still in theory only for certain industries. And I would say, frankly, robots are in theory only for the majority of industries. They truly are. Manufacturing is different. Manufacturing is I make a widget, and I just do it over and over. I can find a robot that can do that, or I can find some type of machinery that can do that. Um, but when it comes to true robotics, being able to come into the office of an accounting firm and they're going to do something, well, you have to ask yourself, well, why do I need a robot to do that? I, I deal with math and statistics and so forth. That's software. I honestly don't need a robot for that. So I think that there are too many people who say robots will be everywhere. Well, maybe robots will be everywhere in specific industries. But the idea that a robot is going to really cook your meal in a restaurant and a robot is going to deliver to you, I already am working with lots of companies in the robotics industry, the restaurant industry, and the stuff they've come up with failed miserably. It's too expensive. And here's the dirty little secret. And they hate it. When I pointed out the robots that they do make, there's nobody to repair them. And so there have been lots of restaurants and hotel chains, um, other hospitality hospitals, they invested in robots and the first day they break down and they're like, well, let's get someone to fix that. And they're like, well, we don't have anyone to fix it because it's a new robot. No one knows how to repair it. So then the only thing they can say is, well, we'll send you a new one, but they don't have a new one because they haven't manufactured it yet. So this industry is still so young. I tell everybody robotics are still in their infancy for most industries. And so that's why I think there's just way too much BS 
that's thrown around about robotics. There are too many zealots. And what I say to people is let's not forget the Segway, how the Segway was going to change the world. Everyone was going to be riding on them. And what I say to people, Segway had lots of press, but no sales because people realized they didn't need that technology. And so I think what's going to happen is we're going to have this massive influx, this upward movement of lots of people talking about robots. But at the end of the day, only a few industries are really going to leverage robots because they just don't need them. It's just the brutal truth. Man, I, I do think that Segway changed everything. Maybe I, I never got to ride one, but they seemed so compelling to have those two wheels and gyroscopes. That's that's as close to uh, robotics as I can imagine. What do you think about that, Jason? Or is it much ado at this stage? Do we, we have five, 10 more years to of test these things and actually deploy them? Or do we see anything meaningful happening these days? Well, so, I mean, let's take manufacturing. You know, I, I love showing my students video clips of like, here's how a paper plant works. And tell them, how many humans do you see in that plant? And they're like, there's there's hardly any humans. Like, <laughs> yeah, we've automated the hell out of most processes. I mean, already. And so that's one where you look at most ma major manufacturing sectors, they are ridiculously automated in comparison to where they were 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. The big marginal benefits that you had were in the 70s and 80s. So you almost have to think with a lot of this stuff, the huge benefits from automation, we achieved those 25, 30 years ago. Absolutely. And then with the initial rollout of a lot of industrial robots around the turn of the century, where you had, I mean, take my state of Michigan, auto jobs did get gutted with the unveiling of a lot of industrial robots that automated tasks like welding. Um, then you, so you have to start asking, what is the marginal benefit of this? And, you know, as Britton said, in a lot of instances, it's, it's difficult to see the business case to be made. I mean, restaurants are a, a good example of this. Um, you know, if that robot breaks down, what are you going to do? Um, because, you know, let's say you've got two robots preparing all your food and one of them breaks. Well, yeah, I'm just at 50% capacity. And now I've got no humans that are going to cook. And rather than I have a sick cook for a day, I now have a broken robot for a week. Absolutely. So, I, I, you know, I think P, it, it just sounds so cool, like the robot's going to do this. It's like, well, unlike in the movies, robots break. Like maintenance is, is a nightmare. That, that's what I, it's a great, you brought that up. So I was at the manifest show and I was looking at an autonomous spotting truck. And what I love about the spotting truck applications, these are, you know, non-DOT regulated trucks. They're off highway. They're in a controlled private, you know, piece of real estate. And they have a robotic arm that is connecting the seven ways and the glad hands, like fascinating. And I said, what's the maintenance schedule on this? Like, what's the interval that we have to, what's the inspection process? And like, we don't have the data on that yet. And I'm like, oh, that's concerning because to your point, like you can sell anything to anyone. It is what happens after it fails. that really cuts the, the shows what the value is. And if you can't service a piece of equipment that you put out there, no one's going to use it. No one's going to buy it. No one has that luxury of having additional robots or additional power units. Now we have some questions and I, I love this because this is kind of interactive with this lunch and learn. I hope everyone's enjoying your, your, your lunch. Uh, this one's the first one I'm going to bring up here. It says, I agree. The big three Chinese firms are transforming retail and logistics as we know it. This does mean more movements from China or their supplier base in Asia. What innovations do you see enabling these companies to move their goods more efficiently? Uh, I will jump to you first, Britton, but my, my initial reaction is they'll probably do what Amazon did, which is what FedEx Ground did, which is a bunch of contractors who end up delivering things. But what are your thoughts? Like, What would what do you think these companies can do that's going to help them efficiently deliver the customer promise that they're they're putting out there? Well, and I'll honestly, the, the things that they're doing, I would not say are new. Um, they simply have said, well, we have much more volume for shipping it to the U.S., so now we need larger facilities and we need a more efficient way to transport. So we're going to make sure we optimize the cap capacity utilization of every trailer we have. So let's make sure we're only shipping full truckload products. If we use vans, we only fill up the vans and then we move them. So I have a lot of people reach out to me and they have themselves convinced that there's something magical going on. There's new robotic technology, this new software. Oh my God, AI is changing the machine world. learning, Britain, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning is doing it all and AI, and they are able to do things that nobody else can do. And it is absolute nonsense. It is 100% false. And I have startups who reach out to me and say, I need you to, I want you to speak on our behalf. 
And I'm like, okay, well, let me see the software. I want to see what it does. And I want you to do a use case, a business case for me, a proof of concept. And they won't do it because what I find out is they're actually relying on the majority of the data coming from established um, ERP platforms and software that's been in, in use for years. So there is really nothing magical. It's basically always comes down to network optimization. How do I cost effectively move goods from a manufacturing plant to a staging facility, a warehouse, and at the uh, maybe at a port? And then how do I effectively load a container and make sure I fill up the capacity of those containers so I'm, I'm, I maximize all capacity utilization? And then how do I make sure I hit the sailing schedules and I the the, the containers are loaded to, on schedule, and then the ship departs and the ship travels three weeks to get to their destination or whatever. There is nothing magical going on. I have been all over China. I used to live there. I used to work there. I still travel there at times. Uh, it's the same thing I've seen in Europe. It's the same thing I've seen in Africa, India. People are trying to say, oh, there's all these, these changes, all these things happening. And I'm like, well, let me look. And I'm like, all that's happening is you're now introducing things that have been in use for years. You're simply digitizing some of it, but at the end of the day, the process you're using has been in use for years, and in some cases, centuries. So I really, I don't want to sound like a naysayer, but I really say to people, let's make sure we understand what's really doing all of this behind the scenes, and don't think there's some magic going on, and it's not because of AI, and it's certainly not because of machine learning. I have challenged every CEO of an AI company and a machine learning company to debate me on stage that they're truly revolutionizing anything with AI or, or machine learning. And not one of them has taken me up on my, my I would like. I'd like to moderate that discussion if I could, Britton, but I'm going to turn to you, Jason, because you you seem to agree with Britton for some of his points. And I just say, what about the algorithm? Like, it's the algorithm. That, that's everything. What what am I missing here? What, what am I missing? A lot of people get intimidated by the word algorithm, and that's the, that's a challenge. So, I mean, th there's nothing special here. It's just proper execution of a business plan, and they're at scale, right? This is the biggest thing. Amazon couldn't do what it did today 15 years ago because they didn't have the scale. Once you reach a certain scale, new opportunities present themselves, which is not a new idea. Anybody can go read the work of Alfred Chandler, a very famous historian at Harvard who studied the rise of big business and... We're talking about the same things back in the 1870s, 1880s. So there's, there's, yeah, I hate to say nothing new. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I think that a lot of folks get almost very sort of intimidated by these things. And so that they want to believe there's this magic. But, you know, there's incredible differences amongst firms within industries. Like one of the things that going back, economists have always found that the, mo the 90th percentile of productivity at a manufacturing plant in the same six-digit industry, so as detailed as it gets compared to the 10th percentile, the 90th percentile plant has doubled the productivity of the 10th percentile. And it could be in something as mundane as ready-mix concrete manufacturing, where it's the exact same production process for the most part across everyone. But one group figures out how to crank out twice as much pr production out of the same facility. So it's it's about execution. Um those three companies are going to be incredible forces, I think, in terms of changing the U.S. retail landscape. I mean, we saw even in Q4 out of China, the amount of air freight that was coming to the U.S. that was consumer products um, was quite impressive. We've not seen that type of cross-border e-commerce trade, which, I mean, FedEx and UPS are licking their chops thinking about getting that. Um but that also, too, shows why this idea of decoupling from China is just absolutely laughable. Um, and it's like we're not decoupling from China anytime soon because Americans like cheap stuff. And we're the problem. We, we, we're the ones we, who are addicted to things faster and cheaper. I, I will tell you, years ago, I used to work um, for a major company that makes, uh, amongst other products, vacuum cleaners. And this was 2009. So right at the end of the second offshoring boom. And somebody in the office was complaining about how all production had been offshored from the U.S. to contract manufacturers in Asia. And they were finished complaining about this and like, man, I got to go shop at Walmart later today because I need some new uh, I need some new silverware. And I'm like, where do you think that silverware came from? It was not American made. And so we are we're our own worst enemy when it comes to this. 
I think it, I look at like retailers are really just brokers of some manufacturer offshore who's brought something in at a price that Americans can can pallet. There's a question here I'm going to bring up, and it, it's it goes to you, Britt. I'm going to I'm going to start with Jason because I, I know Jason just loves this topic. Uh, do you see Apple and Google or Amazon leading self driving cars? in the next five to 10 years. And I can see why Amazon be curious about that. They've invested in a lot of things, but also the delivery aspect of it. Do you, do you see that in your world, Jason? And I'll jump to you, Britton. Uh, mm, I absolutely know because making a car ain't like making a phone. You have no idea at the end of the day, how all these pieces are going to come together until you actually make it. The 10,000 pieces. Oh my gosh. It, it, it's a different world. Like you can anticipate how the different parts of a cell phone are going to interact with each other. That's why you can design it in the U S ship the production overseas to China or India. And there's no issues. The automakers learned a long time ago that you can't decouple design and production for an integrated systems like system like this. Also see Boeing's, tremendous quality issues a lot of that due to excessive subcontracting oh i'm so afraid of flying i'm gonna i'm not even gonna deign to talk about that yeah. Britain, what are your thoughts uh seeing apple google amazon more prevalent in the self-driving car space well i think the way that i think it's a great question and i think it makes a lot of sense to ask that question but i don't believe apple amazon and google on their own are going to lead in autonomous vehicles. I think they'll do it through a partnership. Yeah. Uh, and and I, our, so our questioner actually clarified that, mostly about the tech, technology inside of it, as opposed to making the cars themselves. So he clarified correct. that. Co correct. That's that's basically what I'm referring to is yeah. the tech itself. So I don't, I mean, Google has tried this. And when I, I worked in Russia for Yandex, um, Yandex has their own self-driving unit and they've tried to do all kinds of things on their own and they had to do partnerships. So I think what, what is an interesting perspective is, so what if Apple and Uber partner and they say, we're going to work together on a new, a new type of automation uh, or autonomous vehicle, you know, Amazon and Microsoft or Amazon could acquire Cruise from GM. And GM absolutely should sell Cruise. They've done nothing with it that I think is any benefit. But I think it's going to be a partnership of maybe those one of those three companies or maybe all three of those companies partnering with with other companies who are experts in the autonomous aspect of the, the vehicle. And then together they say, this is a business model. I would have to say it makes most sense for Amazon because what Amazon should be doing is driving Congress to approve laws to allow autonomous vehicles to be used on the roads in more locations. And then Amazon should be investing in Kodiak or some other you know, large trucking company that's autonomous. And maybe Amazon does a really cool partnership with Uber or something like that. And together they say, we're going to come up and we're going to create an autonomous vehicle. And maybe we'll even partner with a manufacturer who can come up with a vehicle of our design, you know, and we're going to do the whole ecosystem. So I think it's not beyond the realm, but let's, let's not forget Apple at one time had the opportunity to acquire Tesla and they walked away from that. They didn't pursue that discussion. And I've all and, and I've I've been disappointed every time I think about those years. I'm like, imagine if Apple had acquired Tesla, how much closer would we be to an autonomous vehicle that really would be at scale? Because the thing that was a weakness for Tesla was the autonomous vehicle part. But there's some really smart people at Apple, and they would acquire the talent to bring into the company, and they would fund it. So I think that there's some really unique things that can happen with autonomous vehicles. But here's the problem. If there aren't more laws on the road or if laws don't allow autonomous vehicles to be used to the in scale yeah. for cars and trucks, what do we gain by doing this? And I think that not enough is really being done to change the laws so that we can start to have more of these vehicles on the road, get more people used to them, and then have real use cases, test cases of how this technology works. And I think that will accelerate the the, the growth of the field completely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think as that regulatory landscape evolves, specific on the FMCSA putting out their proposed rules, or at least like looking for comments around proposed rules, if you can prove the safety case, that it is, it is able to be as safe or safer than a human being driving, that that is a whirlwind of activity. I think you never go back. If you can prove that it can be just as safe, um, that door will never close. And that that ubiquitous nature of autonomous trucks that I see in my own um, mind becomes 
so much more salient. There, there's a question here. I want this might be something for Jason, but I think you would probably have a good thought on this too. Um, this is, well, speaking of robotics and automation with manufacturing or any other industries, what do you guys think about the usage of Gen AI or LLM uh, adoption for E to E supply chain processes? I initially think like the learning language models, like you could automate carrier sales reps, maybe like having somebody who goes out and, and talks to the driver as if it was a human being. But what, what do you think, Britton? What, where, where, do you see any applications for general intelligence AI or LLM in, in our in our industry? Well, 100%. Eventually, we'll get there. Um, the company Solvoyo, uh, it's a Turkish company. They I think they make the best supply chain software in the world. They actually have built AI into many of the things that they do within their platform. And they actually have the ability to automate planning and load optimization, uh, carrier communications and things like that. It's so new though, not a lot of their customers are using it, but it already exists. It's already part of that supply chain software. And I think as with all industries, people are always gonna be looking for, so how do we make ourselves more efficient? How do we become better, faster, cheaper? And when the time is right, when it makes sense and when it's actually capable of doing what it says it can do, I think you'll see more and more companies embracing AI. As far as the large language models, I have companies I work with, um, and the thing that I've said to them is, why don't you just create your own large language model for your data and everything that you do within your ecosystem? Don't pull it, you know, don't pull data uh, leverage in the other large language models that like ChatGPT pulls from or Microsoft. And what I'm seeing is there's more and more companies that say, we're going to have a large language model, but we're going to create it. We're just basically going to use our own data. We're going to create our own large language model. And then slowly, we're going to be letting it access other data, but we're going to prove that that data is valid so we get rid of the hallucinations and other things like that. So I think that this, again, we're in its infancy. Two years from now, we may be saying, wow, can you believe that autonomous software that exists from Solvoyo? Uh, it's 100% AI. It does everything. Is it possible? Yes. Do I think it will happen? No, but at least not now. It may take several more years, but I absolutely think there's a role for everything that was in the question. Yes. And let me be very clear here. Um, I, for one, welcome our robot overlords. I will betray the humans at the first opportunity. I'm on your side. I've been very clear about this. I've been very, very clear. I am fully aligned with the robots. Jason, what do you think about that last question? Like, what do you do you see areas that this type of technology is going to start penetrating that we haven't seen yet? Or is it we're still so early, it's hard to kind of tell where it's going to land? I know. I mean, we're seeing applications for things that are very structured. So again, C.H. Robinson, they talked about in their earnings call how they're using generative AI to handle a lot of basically requests that come in for a quote, because all you have to do is map origin, destination. You know, it doesn't take that many pieces and you can train, train software to do that. And I think they've automated a tremendous number of those responses that way. Rather than a rep having to throw the data into their system, they're just having the large language model do it, look at it and throw it in their system. So again, right now, all the large language models, it's going to be the repetitive tasks, right? So, I mean, if your job is to do something that is very, very, very repetitive and doesn't take that many steps and does not require that much critical thinking, then yes, you're going to have to start really worrying about what are large language models going to do. But at the end of the day, these things really aren't... Again, they are capable of taking prior data and reassembling it, but they're not creative. Like that is a fundamental thing they do not have. They cannot think like a human and be creative. And so that's where if your job is something where it involves strategy and things like this, where you're having to imagine things and you're having to be creative, you're, you don't have a threat yet from things like large language models. These things are basically just, uh, very, 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 very good at searching through the universe of prior data. I tell my students, I'm like, go use chat GPT on all of your quizzes and case studies. And let's see if it if it's going to be able to handle it. Because guess what? It has no idea what the truckload market did last month and how the change of the ratio of spot price to contract price means anything. Right? It's not it's not up to date. So for me, I, there will certainly be applications, but you know, the ever since the Luddites, we've had concerns that technology is going to just wreck everything. And uh, we got more jobs today than we did back in the 1950s and 60s before all of this stuff <laughs> came a reality. 
I, I'm going to share this this comment here. I, I'm going to uh, say I, I I agree. It says uh, taking the liberty of volunteering you three for a monthly recurrence of this show. <laughs> Topic list, anything you want to talk about. But if you want to stay on supply chain, that works. Uh, I, I am certainly open to that, and I will continue to to uh, ping you guys because you guys are some of my favorite people in the space. Uh, we're getting close on time, and I wanted to take a brief moment, Jason, to talk a little bit what we talked about before we went live around ELDs. And one of the things I, I think is so fascinating is the, the requirement by the FMCSA to you know require every truck to have an electronic logging device. So basically run your hours of service in a digital format. And it was pushed, it became a, a thing. And I feel like that, that, that pathway of the ELDs was a door opening of I wouldn't call it driver surveillance. That's not the right word, but cameras facing out, cameras facing in, all of this level of control. Were there any like unintended consequences around the ELDs? Because if we see automation coming for level four and level five, uh, it's going to be something I feel in that same vein. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, so some of the published work I've done with Alex Scott at the University of Tennessee and Andrew Balthrop, actually soon to be of the University of Tennessee as well, we found that, of course, serious hour of service violations did plunge for small carriers. So it really did get hour of service violations under control, the serious ones. And I don't think there's any way to conclude that the carriers were falsifying their way through this because we saw minor violations for paperwork stuff actually go up. So serious violations reduced. Some evidence that speeding did get worse for carriers that were affected by it. So in other words, those small carriers that delayed to the last minute, they did see a little bit of an increase in speeding violations relative to the big boys and girls who are already running ELDs. We've got a separate paper, uh, Alex, and then two of the accounting folks here at Michigan State, myself, looking at the fact there was a weird carve out that if you're engine years before 2000, you can't have an ELD because you don't have what is an ECM electronic. That's right. Isn't that great? Great yeah. that in there. Pre-emission yeah. stuff too, which is even better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so the, what we found with this is we looked at three uh, VIN numbers three years before, VIN numbers three years after that cutoff. And yes, VIN number isn't the same as engineer, but they don't report the engineer on an inspection. So we got to go with the VIN. The folks affected tremendous drop in serious hour service violations. So good. So good thing more likely to intentionally try to avoid fixed weight stations. So we could provide evidence that their percentage, their likelihood of being inspected at a fixed weight station relative to a random stop, random inspection declined more than the other group. So clearly they were trying to evade. Um, so probably adding some extra miles. So not good from a greenhouse gas standpoint, more likely to exit the market. Um, more likely to shift over to subcontracting. So we could subsequently see that VIN number more likely to be associated with a carrier that primarily used lease owner operators versus being a true for hire independent before. So to the extent that opens the can of worms about, you know, worker misclassification and things like that, it's kind of up in the air. That is a um, very good point. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, the th key is all these technologies have unintended consequences. Now, admittedly, where the industry, in my mind, doesn't help itself was, I mean, I'm sure you remember, Matt, back in 2017, oh, my God, there's going to be an exodus of drivers and capacity is going to drop 10 or 15 percent. Oh, wait, we added 50,000 workers to the industry in 2018 because it was a bull market. And at the end of the day, money's what speaks. And so you've had these dire predictions, yet trucking employment reached a new peak in 2022 under not only ELDs, but also getting rid of the grandfathered automatic onboard recorders for, um, when that ended in 2019. So now the question to me is, will we see speed limiters? Because that one gets really interesting. I, I that, uh, that could be a whole episode. I, I am very passionate about that topic, not just the fact that it generally means a safer outcome, generally means you save money on fuel, generally means you save money on maintenance, but there's a lot of control aspects I think are, are really uh, interesting tug in this. Britton, as a last question I have for you before we sign off today, um, what if, if I am in the business of, of manufacturing something or warehousing something, and I have not thought about robots, how do I start? How do I begin to unpack what we have just talked about an hour around? What do you do? How do you, how do you approach something like that? Again, I, I really say you're welcome to contact me. You can search on LinkedIn for other people. Um, you can contact a consulting firm. There's no reason to be searching anymore. 
There's plenty of resources out there. Contact Dr. Miller. Um, have Dr. Miller has. I'm, some- I'm, I'm going to send him to you. So <laughs> I'm just going to broker that right now. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. but there's really no reason to be curious to, to be searching for what to do. But I certainly think they should at least make sure they're aware of this topic, that they understand how it impacts their industry, what's available. And maybe now the time isn't right for them. But I, I always say knowledge is power. You have to be aware of what's going on um, so that you can make a better business decision. So it's really simple. Pick up the phone, e- send an email, you know, uh, schedule a Zoom meeting, reach out to a consulting firm or whatever, but find out really what the facts are and let the facts really dictate what you do. And whatever you do, don't do anything by gut feel and don't do anything because of an assumption or because of something you, you read in an article. You really do need to investigate this, this topic and understand what is it that's going to benefit you, harm you, and what really should you be thinking of? Well, I, I can't end with a stronger note than that. I'm going to kick both you guys off, say a brief goodbye to everybody, but thank you so much for making time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Always love being here, and I'll be back with Dr. Miller and you anytime you want. Outstanding. Thank Most you, sir. welcome. Take care. Take care, guys. Well, that's it. We did it. They said it couldn't be done, but look at us. We have 51 episodes of Fleeting Conversations now recorded. They'll be going off into the internet very, very soon. I can't thank you enough for your support, uh, for sharing the podcast, uh, listening to our guests, learning from the things we talk about. I'm curious. I'm so curious. And I watch the thing unfold, and I know the inflection point is here. I am trying to build the case. What is the case? The connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. These are the trends that we don't get to choose. They're the trends that we are forced to deal with. And looking at experts to help us unpack and understand is what this is all about. So if you like this, please subscribe. You'll see this recording will be on YouTube and Twitter and LinkedIn, and then we'll have it on the Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, and Spotify. Thank you again. What? What? Them? D-A-T? Yeah, Dat. Dat and I are buddies. We're partners. I am so excited that I have the ability to help bring this kind of content to you every uh, so often. And as I always say, thank you for joining us. If you like it, please uh, comment, share, engage. I appreciate you. Have a great day. Then I hit the button and it goes away. And they're both still here so I can talk.